Good morning. Happy Monday. Good to, great to have you here. I hope you had a great weekend. Let's get the party started. All right, so today we're going to start the energy chapter. This is kind of an interesting chapter. It's kind of a cool part of chemistry we haven't talked about so much. Uh, quick reminder that Wednesday uh, at 9 o'clock in this room, the Net Ionics Lab will be due. I know that's unusual, but that's because Friday is Veterans Day, and there won't be lecture, won't have lab, won't have office hours and stuff, so it's totally different. So this Wednesday, have your Net Ionics Lab ready to rock and roll. Any questions? Sweet. So, so far, we've talked a lot about matter and how it interacts, types of reactions, redox, et cetera, et cetera. But we haven't really talked about the energy. And on Friday, I was really pleased. Several of you were touching the test tubes upon reaction, and some of them did feel kind of warm. If you didn't feel it, it's okay too. Don't worry about it. But a lot of reactions have a heat component. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this section. People always think, oh, chemistry explosions, you know, <laughs> fireworks and stuff. Well, it's a lot more than that. And uh, energy is really important to chemistry. But also it's important to all of us even before you took chemistry. So getting, if you took a car that you, runs on gasoline or even electricity, somehow you needed the fuel to get you here. And that's where the energy part comes in. So this is a very different kind of chapter than we've been used to, but it's really powerful. Thermodynamics is the study of heat transfer, all right, or work energy transfer, technically. And thermochemistry is just chemist's version of thermodynamics. So if you hear that, that's cool. Thermodynamics is one of the pillars of physical science. So physics, chemistry, a lot of engineering and stuff, uh, all revolves around this. So this is a pretty cool kind of area. If you take a source of energy and you convert it, you can get some kind of workable energy out. So you can actually burn a lot of the foods that we eat. This is a cheesy example of burning peanuts. And you can turn the peanuts burning into a boiling, you can make your water boil. And making water boil into steam is really where uh, hydroelectric dams come around and a lot of electricity. So there's a lot of energy inside a lot of the things that we eat, drink, and stuff like that. If we combine one gummy bear, which is composed mostly of sucrose, with molten potassium chlorate, a violent reaction occurs. A surprising amount of energy is released by the reactants. In the process, their atoms and molecules rapidly rearrange to form the products carbon dioxide, water, and potassium chloride. The reaction is said to be product favored. I'm still coming down from my Halloween sugar overdose, basically, and this is basically why I'm doing it, because all the candy, if you had any, if you're better than me, that's awesome, but if you, if you had candy, all the candy has a lot of energy inside it, and this was an example of seeing the energy in a gummy bear. Now, gummy bears have lots and lots of energy, and they react with potassium chlorate, the same stuff we used in the KClO3 lab, and it's a redox reaction, but man, a lot of energy comes off. And that's the energy that we get. So you eat a gummy bear, and yeah, I can rule the world. After a while, the sugar crashes, and you know, you're ready to go to sleep or something. But in the meantime, yeah, there's a lot of energy in the foods and, and stuff we drink. So knowing if a reaction gives off energy or needs energy is really important. It's important to chemists, definitely, but it's important to you and me, too. You don't want to have a big test and eat something that's may make you go to sleep. <laughs> so that's just the massive size gummy bear there. But anyway, so this thermochemistry or thermodynamics is just the study of energy. All right, how much energy does it take? How much energy will you get out? Stuff like that. Now, in science, all right, it's really important to think about, like, why do some chemical reactions happen and some chemical reactions don't happen at all? And in the lab on Friday, you saw that some of the reactions, man, you had solids and bubbles and heat maybe, stuff like that, but some of them just sat there. Well, why does that happen? And this is what all scientists and human beings think. Like, why do some happen? Why do some go fast? Why are some slow? So in chemistry, there are two fields which address these kind of questions. 
And this chapter, we're going to look at thermodynamics. And this is basically trying to address the things that make chemical reactions go. We're going to talk about like why precipitate reactions occur and some reactions don't. On the other hand, though, because everybody is impatient, myself included, it's nice to know why some chemical reactions are fast and some chemical reactions are slow. In the KCL3 lab, we added some MnO2, a catalyst, to make it go faster. So if you're thinking about how fast or slow reactions go, there's a second field called kinetics. And kinetics is what allows you to determine how fast and slow reactions go. Now, in this chapter, we're focusing on thermodynamics, all right? The why reactions happen, all right? But we're not going to talk until Chem 222 about how fast or slow reactions go. That's kinetics. We need a few other kind of principles under our belt before we can address it. So, just like everybody, people say, hmm, why did that reaction go? And after a while, you're like, hmm, can I make that reaction go faster or can I make it go slower? Well, we're going to focus on the first one, like why reactions occur. All right, that's thermodynamics. But we're not going to talk about how fast or slow reactions go until Chem 222. We need a few more things under our belt to knock that one out. Thermodynamics determines whether or not a reaction is possible. A reaction that is not thermodynamically favored will not occur to an appreciable extent. Sand is not thermodynamically favored to change into elemental silicon and oxygen, and if undisturbed, no reaction will occur. In the kind of techniques we're going to use in this chapter, you'll be able to tell that sand is not going to break down to its elements, <laughs> all right? There's no way, all right? You can stare at it, you can hit it with gamma rays, you can do whatever you want. Ain't going anywhere, <laughs> all right? That's kind of what thermodynamics is good at. Will it occur? Will it not occur? The thumbs up or the thumbs down kind of questions. That's where thermodynamics is awesome. Reactions that are favored both kinetically and thermodynamically do occur. Paper, for example, will burn quickly in air if ignited. On the other hand, you get a piece of paper back and you're like, I don't want this piece of paper, I'm going to burn it. But yeah, thermodynamics, oh yeah, paper is ready to burn, all right? All your papers are sick of chemistry. Of course you wouldn't do that, but if you are, then you're sick of some class, burn it, <laughs> all right? And that's going to happen. Thermodynamics says, yeah, you try and get rid of your sand. Mm -mm, no, not going to happen. So those are the kind of things that thermodynamics will say. Now, say paper burns really fast. That's kinetics, all right? Thermodynamics is just giving you the green light to say, yeah, it's going to happen. Kinetics controls the rate of a chemical reaction. Even if a reaction is thermodynamically favored, if it is not also kinetically favored, it will not occur in an observable time scale. Diamonds are thermodynamically favored to turn into graphite. But the reaction is so slow, it never occurs. Now, here's one. Some reactions take more time than others. Iron nails react with oxygen slowly, producing rust over a period of months. So, you leave your iron nails out in the rain, they're going to start rusting. That's not a big surprise. And again, that's thermodynamics saying, yep, yeah, that's going to occur. Can't stop it. This is one you may not have thought about if you have any diamonds, all right? Diamonds actually get the thumbs up from thermodynamics to turn into graphite. And graphite is what's in pencils, all right? So a diamond, super expensive, right? And graphite, you know, you can go and buy a Fred Meyer's really, really cheap. So that's an example of one that thermodynamics gives the thumbs up to. And you shouldn't, though, feel like you have to go sell all your diamonds. Like, OMG, oh, my instructor just said all my diamonds are going to break down to graphite. i got to go sell them with this, you know, hawk shop or whatever. No, 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 don't do that. Because the kinetics, the speed of the reaction going from diamond to graphite, super, super slow. Your children's 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 children will have your diamonds if you wish to pass them down, all right? It's an incredibly slow process. It will happen, all right? But the speed is really slow. This reaction gets a thumbs up. It's appreciable. You can leave them out overnight and start to see some rust in it, as I found out once by accident. But anyway, so just remember in the back of your mind that kinetics is also a player. How fast, how slow things go can make a big difference. Yeah. So, graphite's really cheap, right? Is, is, there, is that why 
Is that because there was a bunch of it at one time, meaning there was a bunch of We're going to talk nine. about how to predict if it will occur or not, but it's not about abundance or anything like that. There's actually other kind of things going on. So yeah, so hold tight. Hold tight your questions, man. We're going to get into this. Uh, I'm also not going to be able to tell you like why some reactions are the way they are. I can tell you that these are the rules, all right? Like graphite's not breaking down into diamond or something, but diamond is. and. I can't tell you that, right? That's beyond the scope of thermodynamics. Cool. Now, some reactions that get thumbs up from thermodynamics are things we saw in the lab last week. And that includes if you make a solid, a precipitate, if you have a gas forming from the carbonic acid or something, acids and bases coming together. These are all reactions that get the thumbs up from thermodynamics. In chemistry and in thermochemistry, we would call these product favor reactions in that you're going to make some kind of a compound happen. Now you saw in the lab last week that a lot of the reactions, nothing's happening. And most of the time that was because we didn't have a precipitate, we didn't have gases forming, stuff like that. Now another one that's really important sometimes is redox reactions. That's when you have electron transfer. So my remote control, which has batteries in it, that's something that allows thermodyn thermodynamics says, yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, these four examples are very common in chemistry. And if you can get one of these things to happen, like making a solid or getting an electron transfer, usually that means thermodynamics is pretty happy. Now we're also going to see that if you can transfer energy to the surroundings, i.e. you feel energy like it feels warm, then usually that's an example of a product favored reaction too. And we will definitely talk more about that in a future lecture. So the first law of thermodynamics is called the conservation of energy law. And it just says that you can't create or destroy any energy. So the energy you begin with equals the energy that you end up with. Now, chemically and in science, this is how it's expressed. Uh, the total energy, which is delta E, some books use delta U, that's fine. It equals heat plus work. So heat is gonna be super important to us. It gets the symbol Q. Work is more important to physicists and engineers usually than chemistry, but we'll talk about it briefly. Work is given the symbol W. So the total energy of a system equals the heat plus work for the system. And this, I would argue, is one of the most fundamental things of all physical science. The fact that the total energy has to equal heat plus work, but the change in energy, which is what that little delta symbol means, the change in energy is going to be zero, all right? So just like we were worried about the mass in balancing equations, mass that goes in equals mass that goes out, we're also going to be concerned about the energy that goes in has to equal the energy that comes out. Thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It only changes states. Another Star Trek reference. Again, you don't have to uh, like Star Trek to do well in this class. However, yes, I keep showing things. This is from uh, The newest, not the newest one actually. Oh, well, it's from Star Trek anyway. I'll tell you the reference. But anyway, uh, it's very cool because they do talk about things like this. And all it is is, yeah, the energy that goes in equals the energy that comes out. Uh, the energy will change states, but the total energy will not change. And that's an interesting concept that will have ramifications for what we're going to talk about. Now, Joule, who has one of the most awesome beards of all the people I'll show in chemistry, maybe the, uh, the, one other guy, but anyway, Joule was the first one to propose that there might be a way to measure energy, all right? And the initial type of unit that they used in, to measure energy is called the calorie. Now, this calorie has a little c, and that's really important. I'm going to refer to this as the science calorie, as I'll talk about here in a little bit. And a calorie is just the energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius, all right? And this was kind of the original unit of energy, if you will. However, 
people became, of course, really interested in how many food calories we eat and consume. You want to lose weight, people will figure this out. There's a second kind of a calorie unit, and this other kind gets a capital C. So a, a, a calorie with a capital C is a food calorie. And if you look on the back of your Snickers bar or whatever, hopefully something better you're eating than that, it'll say there's so many calories per serving or whatever. That's literally these values. Now, if you take a thousand science calories, that makes what's called a kilocalorie. And a kilocalorie is equal to a food calorie. The science calorie is much smaller than food calories. But inevitably, people get science calories mixed up with food calories. And they try and capitalize it in Australia and New Zealand. Sometimes they'll use kilocalories uh, on their labels instead of food calories. So instead of using science calories or food calories, which gets confusing, we're going to end up using what was named after James Joule. We're going to use a unit called the Joule. And the Joule, which usually should be capitalized, although not all the time, one science calorie equals 4.184 joules. All right? So it's even a smaller unit of energy than the science calorie. Now, you can make conversions between kilocalories and uh, all this kind of stuff. Don't worry about that. This one's the one that's going to be super and helpful to us. All right? 4.184 joules equals one calorie. We'll talk about kilojoules. A kilojoule is just a thousand joules. All right? This 4.184 number is going to be a number you want to have handy slash memorize. I don't think I'd get a tattoo of it necessarily, but, but 4.184 is in... <laughs> oh, you cool people. You're so much younger than I am, right? You read my mind. <laughs> I, uh, I don't have any tattoos yet. I'm still thinking of the right one. It, it would be 4.184 for me personally. If you decide to, of course, I wouldn't hold it again. All right, profit back on. James Joule, 4.184. This 4.184 joules per science calorie is important, but there's another reason why the 4.184 is going to be really helpful to us. So, um, the joule is a derived unit, and believe it or not, we'll see where this is important later. A joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Don't worry about that right now, but a joule is actually made up of other kinds of units sometimes in science. We'll see that here in a little bit. Let's go. So, joule, 4.184. Now, the total energy of a system, it can go up and down based on heat and work. But remember, the energy of everything has to stay the same. The energy that a system has is dictated by two types of energy. One's called potential energy. This is an example of a lot of potential energies. I was over kind of by uh, Madras in Redmond last summer, and these people were on that bridge right before uh, Redmond, and they were going to bungee jump. <laughs> and man, oh man, respect. So they hook them up to some kind of a big rubber band looking thing, and they're ready to jump off some kind of a system. Potential energy is energy that you have that's ready to go, but it's inside you right now. Gummy bears, before you eat them, have potential energy as well, the energy of the sugar and stuff like that. Once the bungee jumper jumps, then the potential energy is turned into, if you will, like an actual energy. And that's an example of turning your potential into kinetic, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, in science, unfortunately, it's not usually as much fun as bungee jumping, if you consider bungee jumping fun. Usually, in terms of chemistry, we think of potential energy as the, the forces within the molecules. So in an ionic lattice, you have alternating sodium chloride, sodium chlorides. Those positives and negatives have a lot of energy. And if you could break them apart, you can do things with them. Um, so electrostatics, the positives and negatives, super helpful in chemistry. But there is like gravity, uh, nuclear chemistry is a type of potential energy within certain types of molecules. So the potential energy is like energy that's ready to go. But the actual energy that you start using for movement and stuff, that's called kinetic energy. And kinetic energy and potential energy, which are also talked about in physics, are really important. 
Now, when it comes to molecules, there's three types of kinetic energy that are super important. First of all, once the bungee jumper starts jumping, ah! <laughs> all right, that's literally like the, tr the energy of movement, and I would call that transitional, all right? So transitional, all right, just means that you're like moving back and forth. And in physics, if you've took it, a lot of times this is the kinetic energy equals one-half mv squared reaction. If you've seen that equation, cool. If you haven't, don't worry about it. But that's, if, that's a really common equation in physics. And it just says that your energy is equal to the speed squared times mass and half. You'll talk about that more in physics. But in chemistry, in addition to the energy of movement, there's some other kinds too. Vibrations are literally like the molecules vibrating back and forth. So when we have H2O, if I was the oxygen and my hands were hydrogens, those hydrogens are kind of like vibrating like this. So, so far, if I'm a water molecule, I'm transitional, translational, excuse me, energy, I'm moving back and forth, I'm also vibrating, all right? My H and O bonds are going back and forth a little bit. If that wasn't enough, there's rotational. So if I'm water, all right, I'm moving left and right. My hydrogen, oxygen things are vibrating. And I'm also rotating. Now I could rotate this way too, but I'm not that talented. So this is really stupid what I'm doing, but in chemistry, molecules are always doing this. As long as you're above absolute zero, you're gonna have all three of these kind of movements for most molecules. Even the ionic compounds will do this a little bit, all right? It's not as much as the non-ionic uh, compounds, but these are the ways that kinetic energy can manifest itself when you're dealing with molecules. So think about these. Um, in organic chemistry, there's a lot of information you can get from vibrational and rotational movements in molecules. Some of the types of uh, machines they use are based on those. Cool. Kinetic energy absolutely depends on temperature, all right? So if it was a warm day in the summer, I'd be like, yeah! However, as I was talking about earlier, there was some snow in certain places. Today, it's probably more like, like this, <laughs> all right? Like, I'm like, oh man, come on, let's have a snow day. No, of course I'm not really saying that as your instructor who's obsessed with teaching you. But seriously, as the temperature goes up, there's more movement. As the temperature goes down, there's less movement. <laughs> and again, you get to zero Kelvin, and all of these would stop. All right. In energy transfer, there's a lot of discussion as to the system and the surroundings, and I need to introduce that as well. Let's say that you have a chemical reaction where hydrogen and oxygen are gonna make water. Now there's a lot of energy that comes out of that reaction. The system refers to the actual chemicals that are reacting. So that would be the hydrogen and oxygen making water, all right? The surroundings would be everything around the system. So if we're using gaseous hydrogen and oxygen, maybe there would be a piston, all right? And the piston absorbs the energy and would move up that way. Also, some of that energy would be absorbed by the container. So the surroundings is basically everything around the chemical system for a chemist. And that's important because it's the system which is giving off energy and the surroundings which is absorbing the energy. And it can be the opposite too. If you've ever used a cold pack, maybe after a sports injury, you touch it and it get really, really cold. Cold packs work by taking energy from the surroundings inside them, all right? So the system is absorbing those and the surroundings is giving its energy to the system. So think about this in the back of your mind. <clears throat> this is another part of energy transfer stuff you gotta think about. Now, in the last example, I just talked about a hydrogen oxygen making water, the system gives off energy. But a cold pack, if you activate it, the system's actually absorbing energy. So how heat is transferred, the direction in which it's transferred, super important. 
But here's the underlying principle. In all systems ever studied in the entire universe, all right, heat always goes from the hot to the cold, all right? There is no indication of any system that's cold giving up energy to the hot. So the cold got colder and the hot got hotter. Never happened, all right? When cold and hot come together, they become warm, all right? And that just shows that the heat goes from the hot to the cold. The cold takes the energy from the hot. An exothermic reaction is a term that's important. And that just says that that system, those chemicals, are releasing a lot of energy. So this would be like hydrogen and oxygen making water. This is, I think, aluminum and bromine making aluminum bromide, which is also very exothermic. So exothermic means that the chemicals that are involved are giving off lots of energy. Exothermic. And again, it does refer to the system, the chemicals you're looking at. It doesn't refer to the air around it, like the surroundings here are just getting blasted by energy. There's so much energy coming off from the system. Notice here in the symbolism, the heat Q is going to be less than zero, which means negative. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So an exothermic reaction is what maybe you felt in lab last week. If you felt the lab chemicals and they felt hot, yeah, that's the system giving energy off to the surroundings. So in an exothermic reaction, right, your system needs energy to make this happen. So ice only melts into liquid water at room temperature because it's taking the energy from the outside in. It's breaking the solid molecules and stuff like that. Endothermic is kind of the opposite of exothermic. <clears throat> in an exothermic reaction, the thermometer would have an increase in temperature. But in an endothermic reaction, you would actually feel it getting colder. It's taking the energy from the outside to the inside. And since thermometers measure the outside, the system, that's why it feels like it gets cold. So, here's a type of question you might see. <clears throat> You've got a chemical reaction, all right? And it's some random thing, but it feels warm once it's done, all right? And we didn't use a hair dryer or anything like that on it, which means no outside heat was given. So the question is, is this reaction exothermic, endothermic, <coughs> neither endothermic, more information necessary? What do you think? Yep, ah, good, exo, that's right. If you feel a reaction hot after it's been reacting, that means energy is going from the system to the surroundings. You are feeling the surroundings, all right? Unless you could somehow put your finger in the system, which can't happen, at least by our current technology. Yeah, you're feeling the surroundings. <clears throat> so the surroundings got hot. Energy went from the system to the surroundings. That's what exothermic is. So next time you do a reaction and you feel it getting warmer, all right, that means it's exothermic. On the other hand, if you do a reaction and it feels colder, you would have an endothermic reaction. Cool. Now, in physical chemistry, most of the time, the heat which is being transferred when things get hot or cold, the heat is transferred at constant pressure. So Q sub P, like that, is chemist's way of showing you that heat is being transferred at constant pressure. Most of the time we do our experiments uh, just in the room, in the lab, <clears throat> which is one atmosphere of pressure. So most of the time this is what we do. And heat transferred at constant pressure gets a fancy symbol, delta H. And delta H stands for enthalpy. And enthalpy is chemist's friend, if you will, <clears throat> in determining like why a, a diamond goes into graphite after a while. It can also be used to tell why some reactions are hot, stuff like that. So for you in Chem 221, just realize that delta H is like a fancy version of Q. There is a heat transferred at constant volume, Q sub V. We're not gonna talk about it this whole year, but if you took physical chemistry, that's something you would get into. <clears throat> 
Anyway, enthalpy is what chemists usually use to tell if a reaction is exo or endothermic. Sometimes you'll see a little subscript to the right. These are special kinds of enthalpy, all right? And we'll talk about some of those as we go through. The total energy of a system is heat plus work. This is the first law of thermodynamics. And if you're at constant pressure, people substitute Q in for delta H. So the total energy equals enthalpy plus work. Now, 99% of the time, chemists don't worry about work, all right? In physics, that's, a, that's really important, but not so much in chemistry. We're more interested when reactions get hot and cold. So usually then, if you measure enthalpy, it's a pretty good indication as to the energy of your system. And that's why chemists focus so much on enthalpy. And by the way, this is some kind of a blurb for some music star in China or someplace like that. And anyway, apparently enthalpy is pretty popular. Woohoo! I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but anyway, I thought the name was cool. I like the little H delta, although it's delta H. <laughs> Rock stars on their fancy wings. So anyway, uh, punchline of this slide is that when we measure delta H, it's kind of like measuring the energy of the reaction, all right? And that's why scientists like to use it. If you start making uh, your chemicals move pistons, then you'll have to think about the work being done. But in our class, we're going to focus big time on just that. All right. <clears throat> So the enthalpy of a reaction is delta H reaction, and that's the most common kind of energy we're gonna focus on. Now in this reaction, which is a balloon filled, I think it's with hydrogen, and you light it, and bam, a lot of energy comes off. Well, what's happening is hydrogen and oxygen are making water. Because energy is being released, all right, there's a sign that goes along with Q or delta H. And a negative value of delta H, it means exothermic. Just like Q when it's negative, it means exothermic. So the sign of Q and the sign of delta H will tell you if the energy is going to be left off or if you have to add energy to make it happen. Delta H can be many different kinds of units, but a common unit is kilojoules per mole. So a kilojoule is a thousand of those science, of those joules we talked about, and it's a thousand joules per mole of the substance. And we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. <clears throat> now, in thermodynamics, this is kind of interesting. If one reaction is exothermic, the opposite reaction will be endothermic. Now, this is an example, this little box is methane, all right? And natural gas, if you have it in your house, is mostly methane. And methane undergoes a combustion reaction with oxygen to make CO2 and water. And the Bunsen burners we've used in lab, lots of energy given off. So making methane and oxygen go to CO2 and water, this is actually the value. It's minus 890 kilojoules per mole of methane. And notice it's a negative number. Burning things usually creates a lot of energy. However, it is possible, it's difficult, but not impossible, to take the carbon dioxide and water and remake methane and oxygen. It's not easy. It's not something we could do at Mount Hood, I don't think. But anyway, the interesting thing here is that in thermodynamics, the opposite path is the same numerical number, just different signs. So if it's negative 890 kilojoules to go from reactants to products that way, it's gonna be positive 890 kilojoules to go from your products back to reactants. Now inevitably one way will be easier than the other. This way you just light a match. When I get your lighter out there, bam, this reaction goes. To go the opposite way is tough, all right? That would not be a reaction that would be easy to do uh, here at Mount Hood. But I bring that up because that's a weird thing about thermal. Like one way, negative energy. But the opposite way, positive energy. So while one way gets off energy, exothermic, the other way will be positive endothermic, requires energy to make it happen. Now, 
you often can't know the enthalpy specifically for these individual chemicals, but you can measure delta H through a science of a type of science called calorimetry. And calorimetry is just a type of science where they measure the energy coming off. This is called a bomb calorimeter. And a bomb calorimeter is a fancy type of device that they can measure how much energy is released or absorbed. Um, not this week for this class because we won't have class on Friday, but the next week we're actually gonna do a calorimetry lab. We're gonna use just coffee cups. <laughs> I had to drink a lot of coffee to get there. No, seriously, coffee cups are a pretty good way to uh, measure heat things. So calorimetry scientists are really measuring the science of these different things going back and forth. Heat or thermal energy is associated with the motions of atoms and molecules in a substance. The more rapid these atomic scale motions, the greater a substance's thermal energy and the hotter it is. When we plunge a hot metal bar into cool water, thermal energy from the bar transfers to the water. While the atoms and molecules of the bar slow down, those of the water speed up. The transfer of energy can be measured as a rise in water temperature. Molecules of a hot substance move more rapidly than those of the same substance with a lower temperature. If the two samples come in contact, a transfer of molecular momentum occurs from the rapidly moving molecules to the slower ones. In this way, thermal energy transfers from the hotter sample to the cooler one. When the two samples have similar rates of molecular motion, they have reached thermal equilibrium and have the same temperature. So remember that there's no examples of hot and cold coming together where the hot gets hotter and the cold gets colder. Hot and cold together create something warm that's in between. And that's been the only thing that's ever been observed. So in the kinetic molecular theory, which was the same way we described the solids, liquids, and gases a couple weeks ago, kinetic molecular theory then uses this idea where the hot is just busting out. All the little atoms just have so much energy. Cold is kind of chill. But they come together and the heat is transferred from the hot to the cold until you get to what's called thermal equilibrium. All right. And thermal equilibrium just means that the hot is now warm and the cold is now warm. You're kind of in this halfway point. And you can see how what they did, uh, water is a common way to measure uh, these kind of temperatures. And we'll talk about how this works with calorimetry. <clears throat> now, this poor Batman and Robin thing, first of all, Batman shouldn't slap Robin, that's also bad. However, I love this. People say, close the window, you're letting the cold in. Not by thermochemistry, because thermochemistry is all about the heat. If you leave the window open, it's the hot air which is moving out. It's not the cold air coming in, it's the hot air going out. So you'll understand this kind of aggressive comic meme if you see it in the future, so. Anyway. How scientists describe energy transfer is through this equation right here, and this is the first big equation of this section. Q equals mc delta T. M is the mass, usually in grams. Heat, Q, is usually an energy value that's in joules, sometimes delta H, but this one's usually Q. Delta T is the change in the temperature. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But the C is the important part. C is what they call the heat capacity for the substance. And every substance from your blood to aluminum to water has a heat capacity value. And as that value of heat capacity goes up, it takes more energy to allow, to allow that substance to get hotter. If the value is low, it takes less energy to make the substance gets hotter. So Q equals MC delta T officially is heat transferred with no phase change. And that means you're not turning your liquid water into ice. You're not turning liquid water into steam. You're not melting your aluminum into gaseous aluminum, something like that. <clears throat> and this is our first big equation here. Now Q is just heat, it sometimes is enthalpy delta H, and Q can be positive or negative. If the Q is negative, that means that the energy is being given off. If Q is positive, it means the energy is going into your system. 
M is mass, usually grams, not moles. I know it seems incredible, but it's true. C is what they call the heat capacity or specific heat capacity of a substance. And every substance in every phase will have its own value. We'll talk about that a little bit. Delta T is an interesting substance. It's a change in temperature. Delta, for scientists, is always final minus initial. So delta temperature would be final temperature minus initial temperature. You can also have a delta volume, for example, which would be final volume minus initial volume, or delta time, which would be the final time minus the initial time. But for us here, it's just temperature. Now, in chemistry, I said how in lab, a lot of times we record things in Celsius. A delta T in Celsius, from zero to 100 degrees would have delta T final 100 minus zero initial. So delta T would be 100. In Kelvin, this is 273 Kelvin to 373 Kelvin. So if you had a delta T in Kelvin, you'd say, all right, final 373, initial 273. But notice how delta T is the same in Kelvin as it is in Celsius. And this is pretty awesome for scientists because sometimes you'll just want to use delta T in Celsius. Sometimes you'll have the Kelvin values and you want to find it there. Same delta T, all right? The individual temperatures will be different, but the change in temperature is going to be the same. So you can use delta T in Kelvin or Celsius and get away with it. And then finally, a Q, the magnitude of Q will tell you something interesting, especially the sign. If Q is positive, that means the heat is going into your system. That's the cold pack that's activating. On the other hand, hydrogen plus oxygen making water, you're gonna get a lot of energy out. You're gonna get negative Q values. Those are exothermic. All right, so I'm sure you're just dying to see an example. Uh, oh, these are some examples of heat capacities. Water, liquid water, 4.184. Same number as the joules to science calories converged earlier. But the 4.184 liquid water is a number we'll use quite a bit. Now, this is actually one of the highest heat capacities known. Um, liquid ammonia is a little bit higher, but that's the only one that I know that's any higher. Water is truly just about magical, and I don't want to use magic in a science class too much. However, water is as close to that as we can make it happen. Um, most metals are much less than the heat capacity of water. They heat up and cool down very quickly. Here's ethylene glycol, glass, and stuff like that, different types of things. So here's an example of how we can use this process. Let's say that we have a hot piece of aluminum. And hot piece means that it's starting at 310 Celsius, and we're allowing it to cool down to 37 Celsius. If we have 25 grams of aluminum with these conditions, we can figure out how many joules of energy are being lost by the aluminum system. Because here, aluminum is cooling down. It's giving off its energy. So if we have done all this right, the Q here should be a negative number because heat is being lost. It's cooling down, all right? This is where we can use MC delta T. Now you will need the heat capacity of aluminum. Here's the value. I'll give it to you. You can look it up on Google or whatever. Anyway, Q equals MC delta T. C is specific heat. And again, delta T is final temperature minus initial temperature. Now you could go through and convert those Celsius temperatures to Kelvin and use those, and that's fine. I wouldn't, because a delta T in Celsius is the same as a delta T in Kelvin. So if you use the final temperature of the aluminum, 37, and it started at 310 Celsius, the initial temperature, here's the mass, here's the C heat capacity, MC delta T, negative 6,160 joules. So as that hot piece of aluminum cools down, it's gonna give off 
negative 6,160 joules. Is this exothermic or endothermic? Exo. Exo, thank you, well done, absolutely, man. Exothermic, all right, energy is being released. Negative signs tell you that it's exothermic. Let's say you did this reaction and Claire's like, oh man, I wanted to see it cool down. Oh, so Clifford and I are like, okay, fine. So we take our 37 degree cell piece of aluminum and we heat it to 310 Celsius. How much energy would that take the opposite process? Plus. Plus, nice job Clifford. It would take positive 6,160 joules. If one direction is negative, the other direction will be positive. All right, we're not changing the mass, we're not changing the delta T, still aluminum, same Q C. But what we're doing, what Clifford and I will do to make Claire see this, we'll flip these temperatures around, all right? The initial temperature will be 37, and the final temperature will be 310. So the sign will tell you a lot. All right, this is exo, energy is being released by the aluminum. But we heat it up again, it's gonna be positive 6,160 joules. So negative means that heat's lost by the system, it's exothermic. In this problem, the aluminum is cooling down, it's giving off its energy. So it started at 310, the initial, ended at 37 degrees. Delta T, once again, can be Celsius or Kelvin. So it would not be wrong to say 37 plus 273 would be this number, and 310 plus 273 would be that number. But it would just be probably not worth your time, all right, because it has a little extra math in it, and chemists are lazy, whatever you want. However, you always have that option to use Celsius or Kelvin, either one is totally fine. So, we transfer 100 joules of energy to 5 grams of copper. And the copper is initially at 20 degrees Celsius, but since we're transferring the heat in, the final temperature is 71.9. You can actually use this information to calculate the specific heat of copper, the C value. So what you would do, and I'll show you how this works, Q equals MC delta T. All right, Q would be 100 joules, M the mass, five grams. We're looking for C, the heat capacity, and the final minus initial would be delta T. So you go 71.9 minus 20. If you wish to do that problem, which is cool, I recommend, that's totally fine. Heat capacity of copper, 0.385 joules per gram Kelvin. You could also write that as joules per gram Celsius. Scientists a lot of times keep things in Kelvin. Okay. Now, here's another kind of question you might see. How, now we have a piece of iron. Initially, it's at 77.8 Celsius, and it's placed in 244 grams of water at 18.8 degrees Celsius. Now I want you to visualize what's happening. Hot iron, cold water. What's gonna happen to those two temperatures? Equilibrium. Equilibrium, yeah. They're gonna go to somewhere in between, all right? Because hot plus cold equals warm. So in this problem, your hot iron and your cold water are gonna come together at some equilibrium temperature. It's gonna be warm, which means in this problem, more than this number and less than this number. How do we solve this, Dr. Russell? Oh, I'm so glad whoever has that in the back by there. Well, remember that the total energy of a system won't change. This is first law of thermodynamics. So you can say that the Q hot part plus the Q cold part equals zero. Now the hot part here is the iron. So there's MC delta T for iron. Here's MC delta T for the cold water and all of that equals zero. Let's rewrite this a little bit. The iron's heat capacity, 0.449. You don't have to know that, I would give you. I do want you to know water's heat capacity, 4.184, so put that on your notes, memorize whatever you need to do. And your final temperature will be the same. 
So if you break this up, MC delta T for iron plus MC delta T for water equals zero. Final temperature for both water and iron is going to be the same number. So this is a great problem then. We'll multiply these parts together, multiply them by delta TF and this number, these numbers by TF and that number, and solve for TF. Now I'm just going to give you some hints here, and before Wednesday, go through this. Make sure you know how to do this. It's just algebra, all right? This times both of those distributive properties, this times this one both. At the very end, your final temperature should be warmer than the cold, but it's cooler than the hot. And in this problem, 21.0 is the value you get. That will be the final temperature of your system. Cool. All right, I'm a little low. Oh, I'm actually right on time. All right, uh, that's it for today. Woohoo, MC Delta T. Uh, we'll take up more of this on Wednesday. Remember that on Wednesday for section 01, your lab is due at 9 o'clock. You'll turn it into me up here. Questions on that? Have a great day.